This is the Prestigious Initiative. Welcome. I'm Chris Bean. Today we're going to begin our study of septemics. If you haven't caught our recent episode with Mr. Jim Marshall, make sure you give that a listen. I'll leave the, the link for that in the description to these videos. What's going to happen is we're going to go through a study of septemics, all of the different areas, all of the different scales uh, from the author. And what's going to happen is we'll have a slide up on the, on the screen, and he's going to give us details to help us to better understand this information so that we can apply that to our lives to help us and to help others. Jim, how are you today? Great. Glad Great. to see you. All right. So do you have anything to, to add as we as we get started today, or should I just go for the first slide here? Well, let me just say that I am the discoverer of hitherto unknown natural phenomena, which greatly aid in the understanding of people, from which I created a revolutionary practical philosophic system called Septemics and published it in the book, Septemics Hierarchies of Human Phenomena. And today we're going to talk about some of the content of the book. Okay, so let me just say that septemics is philosophical science based on the fact that many aspects of human phenomena resolve into a hierarchy of seven steps. So it's actually a collection of scales, each of which delineates uh, human phenomena across the spectrum, and there are 35 different scales. Now, the word septemics literally means of or pertaining to seven. If you look at the logo, it's a seven-pointed star. Each ray points in a different direction and is a different color. But between them, they make a spectrum. And that is what each of these scales is like. So notice the subtitle is Analysis, Prediction, and Management of Human Affairs. So this book and the data that I'm going to give you it enables you to analyze human phenomena and consequently predict human phenomena and consequently manage human affairs. So let's go to the first scale. Okay, so this is the first of the individual scales. Individual scales meaning they apply more to individuals than to groups. This is a scale of basic purposes. It's the first scale in the book. Uh, it's actually the first scale that I discovered that led me to realize that this was a separate subject, septemics, and it's the most important. Uh, when you find your level on this, it is a life-changing experience. And when you find somebody else's level on this scale, it's extremely valuable information because this is a persistent characteristic of a person. Most people, more than 90%, spend one's entire life at one level of the scale. So once you know the person's level, that's probably not going to change. So you'll be able to predict that person's behavior for the rest of his life. And it tells you what the person is about. So what could be more important than knowing someone's basic purpose? It's what the person is trying to do all the time. There are only seven basic purposes, and all the other ones that might pop up are subsets of these. Now, this is described as a linear quantum general scale. Every scale is either linear or spiral, quantum or gradual, and general or specific. So I want to explain those. Uh, a, a spiral scale is one in which there is an apparent congruence between level one and seven. Uh, and this leads people often to make mistake in mistaking level one for level seven, which is a catastrophic mistake. Uh, quantum, this is a quantum scale, meaning there's no gradation in between the levels. One jumps instantaneously, if at all, from one level to the next. So at one point in time, you're at leader, for example, and a billionth of a second later, you're at saint. There is no gradual 
growth between the levels. Also, this is a general scale, meaning once you know the level of a person on this scale, you're done for that person. You can try to move the person up, uh, but there's no other application as opposed to a specific scale. In a specific scale, it's context-driven, meaning you could use it in many different ways, in many different contexts, and you get different levels for the person for different contexts. This scale is not like that. It's a general scale. Once you find your level on the scale, you're done. Although you could try to move yourself up. Uh, changing level on the scale requires the most enormous stimulus conceivable to a human. So it would require some spectacular transformational event to move up or some horrific traumatic experience to move down. So for example, if a person is in a Nazi concentration camp and survives, there's a good chance it'll knock him down a level. So he goes into the camp at let's say level three, when he comes out, he's at level four. Uh, the most famous example in history of a person going up the scale is St. Paul. Paul was originally known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen. And his job was to oppress Christians. So he was on his horse on the road to Damascus. This is all discussed in the Bible. When he had some transformational experience. Now, it's hard for us to know exactly what happens, but from what we do know about it, it clearly caused him to go from level two up to level one. He was a leader, level two, in his life, uh, and he had this job of pressing this, what the Romans viewed as uh, a noxious cult which is Christians, and he was going about conquering them. So then he had this experience where he was knocked off his horse, and he heard a voice say, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he then became a Christian uh, and became the person most responsible for spreading Christianity, St. Paul. So he moved up to one. He went from being a leader to being a saint. And when they came along, when the Romans came along to crucify him, he didn't complain. He didn't try to get out of it because his goal was transcendence. So he knew that he was going to go to heaven. So go ahead and kill me. Uh, and that was the view of many Christians uh, down through the ages who were martyred. You want to kill me? That's fine. I'll be in heaven in 10 minutes. So that was, that's the goal of a person in level one. Okay, so now let's talk about the axis. Each of these 35 skills has a different axis. And the axis is represented by the dotted vertical line. Now, this tells you what we are measuring with this scale. So, for example, you have a yardstick. What does it measure? It measures inches. So I'm giving you, in each of these 35 skills, a yardstick, so to speak, by which to measure human activity uh, or human affairs. Now, at the top of this continuum, we have courage, wisdom, and ethics. So a saint is the embodiment of courage, wisdom, and ethics. And if you study saints, which I have done, or know saints, which I've had the privilege of knowing, you can see this, it's right there. They're wise people, they have immense courage, and they're extremely ethical. Uh, and the reason the Romans couldn't stamp out Christianity is Christians didn't care if the Romans killed them because they were transcendent. They wanted to go to a higher level. That's what transcend means. So this threat that, you know, we're going to kill you, all right, kill me. This will be over in 10 or 15 minutes. 
and I'll be in heaven, and you'll still be down here. That's the attitude of a transcendent person, which is why they have immense courage. At the bottom, you have the opposite, which is fear, stupidity, and criminality. Fear is the opposite of courage. Stupidity is the opposite of wisdom. And criminality is the opposite of ethics. So a person who's at level seven lives in fear, stupidity, and criminality. Adolf Hitler was at this level. His basic purpose was destruction. As you can see there, it says destruction. And if once you understand this, he's easy to understand. Uh, as a serious historian uh, whose specialties include World War II, I studied Hitler for a very long time. And uh, initially, it was hard for me to understand many of the things he did. I would ask, why would he do that? Well, once I understood this scale, now I understand why he did it. It's crystal clear to me. He was a person who was fearful, stupid, and criminal. Uh, you hear a lot about how evil he was, and I agree he was evil, but you don't hear too much about how fearful he was. I mean, if you're going around killing people, you must be afraid of them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be killing them. Uh, he did astonishingly stupid things. Like, for example, he had signed a non-aggression pact with the Russians uh, to forestall the possibility of them attacking him from the east because he was busy fighting people to his west. Uh, and his second in command, who was not a stupid person, Goering, said, if the Russians get into the wall, we will lose. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, very stupidly, Hitler attacked the Russians when he had a non-aggression pact. Hitler was... People who understand military science, like myself, just scratch their heads. But once you realize that this was a destructive person, you have to understand a destructive person is destructive in every direction. He's destructive not only to his enemies, he's destructive to his family and his friends. So that was a destructive thing to do. It was destructive to Germany. And I think most people know that the man was a criminal. He did all kinds of horrible things that a criminal would do. Uh, he displayed the same behaviors that you see in uh, professional criminals like Vito Genovese. So He's a famous example of a person at this level. Now, before we go into the details, I want to talk some more about the structure of the scale. Now, notice at the extreme right, it says superhuman, human, and subhuman. So these levels break down into three categories of people. Superhumans at the top, humans in the middle, and subhumans at the bottom. Now, superhumans have abilities that the rest of us do not have. Uh, and if you study these people, like, for example, Gandhi, he was a saint. He was at level one. What he did was unbelievable. I mean, he got the British to let go of India without ever firing a shot at them, without ever throwing a bomb. It's, it's a historically shocking event, what he accomplished. This was a man who had no office, who had no money, who was just his own superhuman ability. Then we go to the middle section, which is human. That's where most of us are. That is the largest group. That's uh, something like 60% of humanity. Um, is that in the human category. That is what we're used to seeing. That is what most of us are. And these are what, what psychologists would call normal people. And then at the bottom, we have subhumans. Subhumans are humans, but their behaviors, their uh, ways of thinking about things and doing things is 
qualitatively below what most of us would ever think of or do. Now, it is true for most of the scales that most readers have difficulty grasping the extremes of the scales. For example, uh, let's say you have somebody like Francis of Assisi. He came from a rich merchant family. And he was expected to take over the business. He continued to be a rich Italian merchant. Well, the long and short of it is he went up to level one. He became a transcendent person and he became St. Francis of Assisi, where <clears throat> he had no interest in worldly possessions. And he devoted his life and his wealth to forming uh, a religious order that just taught Christianity and did acts of kindness to people. So his father was probably a human, and his mother probably too, and they probably were just scratching their heads saying, what is he doing? Uh, because, see, he's at the extreme of the scale. So they would really not understand that. Similarly, uh, when you have a person like Charles Manson, who's obviously a subhuman, I'm sure there were people in his family, you know, watching what he was doing with his cult and everything, saying, what is Charlie doing? See, they didn't get it because it's at the extremes of the scale. And this is true for all scales. There is this tendency for most of us to not have a reality on the extremes of the scales uh, because it, it, it's so different from what we think and what we believe and know. But also, many people have never even seen it. Now, I was educated by clergy, so I got to be around some saints. So I got used to what they were like. Uh, also, in case you didn't know, the mafia was extremely powerful in New York City, which is where I'm from. And in those days, before Rudy Giuliani came in and cleaned it out, uh, you had the church, the government, and the mafia. Those are like the three pillars of New York society. Virtually no one was disconnected from the mafia. When you went to the corner to buy a paper from a newsstand, that guy was taking numbers for the mafia. If you went to a florist to buy flowers for your wife for Valentine's Day, that guy was part of the gambling operation for the mafia. That's how prevalent it was. You could go from store to store to store. Uh, you could rent an apartment to somebody. He had connections to the mafia. So anybody who was in New York in those days was exposed to the mafia. Uh, Carlo Gambino, who was the person whose name was given to the Gambino crime family, lived in my neighborhood. He was a perfectly unobjectionable person. He, he looked like a regular, normal guy. He didn't wear custom-made suits. He didn't live in a mansion. He didn't drive a Cadillac. He was friendly. He went to Our Lady Grace Church same church I played baseball for, and he was around. My father was a friend of his. So I got to be around some of these people, okay? Most of them are subhumans. Carlo Gambino was not. He was an exception, which is why they never got anything on him, and he died in his own beautiful home of a heart condition at, I think, 76. Uh, but I met some of these other Mafiosi, they were terrifying people. I mean, they were scary, scary people. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I used to be a partner in uh, a costuming business where we would make custom made clothes for people, mostly for people in the entertainment business. But this one client came into us and said, Oh, make me a custom made suit. Okay. I'm not going to turn down business. So they got, you know, he has to take off his clothes so we can take measurements, right? Guy had bullet holes in him. 
many bullet holes in it. So, I mean, they were healed, but still, you know, that's, so that, those are subhumans, okay? Professional criminals, war criminals, serial killers like Jack the Ripper, corrupt politicians. These are subhumans. Okay, now, if you notice at level four, there's a horizontal line and above and below it, it says social and antisocial. So level four is the dividing line between social people and antisocial people. Demographically, there are actually more antisocial people than social people on earth. Uh, and if you look at the demographics, which I give you, you can calculate that yourself, which is why the world looks the way it does. You know, Earth is just seething in criminality. Most of it is behind the scenes. Uh, most of it is not prosecuted. Most of these people are not caught. There's antisocial behavior going on in every place you go. Uh, so if someone is at level one, two, or three, which is less than 30% of the population, those are social people. If your person is at five, six, or seven, which is about 43%, those are antisocial people. At level four, you have a neutral point. Many of the scales have what you might call a point of equilibrium at the center, where the person is neither social nor antisocial. So that is the largest demographic group. Uh, normals. Okay, so let's look at this from the bottom. So, oh, before I do that, let me talk about this plus and minus that you see. Next to the names of the levels is either a plus or a minus. That does not mean good or bad, doesn't mean add or subtract. There are seven scales that have this plus or minus mathematics built into them. What this refers to is the basic pattern of this universe, which is that the universe is bipolar or dichotomous. In order to have an in, you must have an out. In order to have an up, you must have a down, and so forth. So basically, you're either inflowing or outflowing. So like the water in your pipes flows in and it flows out. Uh, now, that is what the plus and minus means. If it says minus, that means inflowing, and if it's plus, it means outflowing. This is obvious when you study these people. Now, a better way to think about this, instead of inflow and outflow, which is a scientific term, is reach and withdraw, which is more of a psychological way of looking at it, human behavior. You can either reach towards something or withdraw towards something. So, like, when a normal guy sees a pretty girl, he sort of has an outflow to her, even if he doesn't say anything. He's reaching. And uh, if somebody does something bad to you, you withdraw from them. Again, even if you don't say anything, even if you don't go anywhere, there is a withdrawal going on. So the saint is on an inflow, meaning he's withdrawing from life. I think that's fairly obvious. Someone who's transcendent, his objective is to transcend, he's withdrawing from the world. And if you observe these people, you can see that. They're not interested in wealth, power, fame, or anything else like that. They want to transcend, regardless of what religion they belong to. The leader, on the other hand, has an outflow going. He wants to conquer. Conquest is clearly an outflow. Okay, the winner is an inflow. Why is it a winner? This person is feathering his nest. In other words, he's drawing wealth into himself. All right? Now, wealth doesn't just mean money. It can mean all kinds of things. It can mean an Oscar if he's an actor. It could mean a World Series ring if he's a baseball player. It could mean horses if he's a rancher but he's inflowing these things into him. 
self. Normal is on an outflow. It's kind of a tepid outflow, but it's an outflow of conformity. So when the normal outflows, it's to conform. So if people grow their hair long, the normal grows his hair long because that's what people are doing. If people cut their hair short, then he cuts his hair short. See, that's how he outflows into the community. Uh, if everybody's on the internet, he gets on the internet. Uh, if everybody stops using TikTok, he stops using TikTok because he's a conformist. Then loser, loser is an inflow. Now, uh, the, the, the loser is pulling suffering, destruction, catastrophe, disaster into himself. See, that's how it's an inflow. Why he's doing that, we'll talk about later. The criminal is clearly on an outflow. They outflow bullets. They outflow bombs. They outflow uh, punches, right? They're outflowing things. Like when a person uh, blackmails you, that's an outflow. See, they're doing something to you. So that's what a criminal is about. A subversive, on the other hand, is pulling destruction in on everything, pulling in destruction, which you can easily see if you study somebody at this level, like Pol Pot or Hitler. Okay, so you understand the plus and minus. Now, let's go through these objectives. Now, many people, as I said, are gonna have some difficulty grasping the extremes of the scales. And they would ask, that doesn't make any sense. Why would a person's basic objective be destruction? Well, you have to realize this is a person who is really crazy. Uh, he, he, his life is filled with fear, stupidity, and criminality. And that's what destruction is about. Uh, fearful people destroy things. Stupid people destroy things. Criminals destroy things. That's what these people do. Fortunately, there aren't too many of them. They're pulling destruction in not only on themselves, but on everybody around them, on their families, on their organizations. Up from that, you have the criminal. Now, this is much easier for most people to understand. This is a guy who's out for himself. His objective is pleasure. He doesn't care how he gets it. Now, the subversive will kill you just because he's a destructive person. The criminal doesn't really do that. The criminal will only kill you if it suits him. So you have some drug dealer. He's going to do some big drug deal from which he's going to make $2 million. And you do something to get in the way of that, he'll have you killed. He doesn't particularly want you dead, but you're getting in the way of his pleasure. See, he wants that $2 million so that he can buy yachts, women, alcohol, drugs, big screen TVs, custom made suits. Whatever gives him pleasure, that's what motivates him. So that's what tells you. If you see a person who's motivated by pleasure, that tells you he's a criminal. Now, of course, everybody wants pleasure to some degree, but this is his basic purpose. So have you ever noticed how many people in the mafia are overweight? Isn't that interesting? Let me have that spaghetti. Yummy. So, uh, and after that, they'll, you know, eat a pint of ice cream, right? Because it's all about pleasure for them, you know? And then, okay, let's have the vino and then bring on the women, you know? So that's what motivates those people. That is their basic drive. They're not really interested in anything other than pleasure. Now we crossed over from the subhuman into the human and we get to a type of person that is very poorly understood by most people, what I call the loser. A loser is not merely someone who's doing badly. Anybody could be doing badly. A loser is someone who sabotages himself. Why does he do that? Because his objective is suffering. And you might say, well, that's crazy. Yes, I agree with you. It's crazy. It's not as crazy as being at six or seven, but it's still crazy. Now, the difference is 
Subhumans have no conscious conscience. The loser has a conscience, and because he has a conscience, he makes himself suffer. On some level, he won't probably say this to you, although he might if you can get him to open up. This guy thinks he's bad, he deserves to suffer, he deserves to lose, I'm a bad person, although he might not be willing to admit that. But that's his objective. Now, this is the type of guy, you can give him $50,000, he'll blow it in Vegas. You give him a new car, he crashes it. You give him a house, it burns down. You get him a job, he gets fired. Okay? There's no helping these people. So all these do-gooders who think that they can help anybody are wrong. You cannot help these people. If you try to help somebody at seven, he'll just have you killed. If you try to help somebody at six, if you get in the way of his pleasure, say, look, go away. I'm busy. I'm busy with my bond here, you know. Uh, but you can't really help that person. He doesn't want to be helped. He just wants more food and more liquor and more drugs. The loser, people, social workers say, oh, I'm going to help this poor person. These are people, some of them kill themselves with drugs, some with alcohol, some with bad relationships. Some of them eat themselves to death. There's all kinds of ways that people make themselves suffer. And uh, if you run away, run into one of these people, stay away from them. You're not going to help them. Can't be done. Now, what could be done, theoretically, is to move the person out of level five into level four, and then you get a normal person. A normal person who will be a conformist. But if the person's basic purpose is suffering, and you try to help the person, you are opposing his most basic objective. You cannot succeed. And this is one of the reasons why socialist schemes always fail. Because you have 20% of the people, it doesn't matter what you give them. Oh, we're going to give you free health care. They'll still find a way to wreck their lives. Maybe they'll go out and wrap their car around a tree, you know, and break both legs. But they're going to find a way. Now, of course, criminals, they just take full advantage of socialism. Oh, great. I'm going to figure out a way to get this money from the government. See, they come up with schemes to, to take advantage of the government's largesse. And subversives, they just, they just kill people willy-nilly. Now, a subversive in destroying you, he doesn't necessarily have to kill you. He might just turn you into a drug addict, which is, as far as I'm concerned, very similar to killing somebody. So let's go up to the normal. So we talked about they're conformist. They'll, they want to do whatever is in vogue. These people, now some people might say, well, conformity is not a good thing. But think of it this way. These people don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to create any controversy. This tells you right away what you're looking at. This person uh, is going to sort of keep a low profile and fit in in whatever way society is structured. Then up from that, at level three, is the winner. Now, the winner is a person who's driven to accrue wealth. So when you see these people who spend their lives accruing wealth, they're winners. They're inflowing wealth to themselves. They're not concerned about helping other people. They're just going to get, you know, a billion dollars in the bank. You know, this is the type of person who having, you know, a regular 1,500 square foot house is not enough. They have to have a 40,000 foot mansion with 10 bathrooms, okay? That's a form of wealth. That's what that person is about. Then you go up into the superhuman band and you come to the leader. This is people like Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, 
Alexander the Great. These people, their basic purpose is to conquer. Lincoln was determined to conquer the Confederacy. Uh, Churchill was determined to conquer the Nazis, specifically the Nazis. The leader is down for the struggle. The leader, the leader is not doing this for selfish reasons. There is something that needs to be conquered and he's gonna conquer it. So leaders have terrible things happen to them. Perfect example is Alexander Hamilton, who is a leader. And if you study him, it's perfectly clear. From childhood, he was at this level and he wanted to conquer. He kept asking Washington, please give me a command. He was a colonel. Please give me a command, I wanna fight. No, Washington would say, I need you right here with me. Washington kept him at his elbow until the very last battle of the revolution, which was at Yorktown. He finally said, okay, you're in command, go and take that outpost, and he did. But the, this is somebody who will not protect himself, Lincoln. When he went to Fort Snyder, he could have been surrounded by a whole company of the Union Army if he wanted. And somebody suggested that. And he said, nah, if somebody wants to kill me, they'll kill me. And John Wilkes Booth did just that. So one of the ways you can spot leaders, they have bad things happen to them. You know, Winston Churchill had a lot of bad things happen to him. His life was no bed of roses. But if it weren't for Churchill, the English would have surrendered to the Germans. The Germans were trying to get the English to surrender for years and years. And the only reason they didn't was that Churchill was the prime minister. And he was determined to defeat the Nazis and Hitler in particular. Now, some people say, well, conquest is not a good thing. Well, that's a question of whose ox is being gored. For many people, uh, the defeat of the Confederacy by the Union in 1865 was a very good conquest. All the slaves were freed. And Lincoln went a step further to push through the 13th Amendment, making slavery unconstitutional. But so what, what he did was considered impossible in his day by most people. But he did it because he was determined. And if you study the man, you can see he had very little help in doing this. His generals wouldn't fight until he found an obscure general named Grant and his buddy, Sherman. Those two generals were the ones who won the Civil War for the North. They were willing to fight. They were willing to conquer. McClellan, who was the original commander of the Union forces, he just wouldn't fight. He kept saying, well, I need another 3,000 horses. I need another 500 barrels of, of uh, gunpowder. Uh, I need another 100 cannons. And he kept doing this. This went on for years until Lincoln finally got rid of him. But Lincoln went through a few guys like this until he found Grant. So if you look at what happened to Lincoln and Alexander the Great, these people were about conquest and they had untimely demises. Alexander the Great conquered the known world and died at 28. He just kept conquering until he died what most people believe was malaria. So that's one of the ways you can spot the leader. He has bad things happen to him. See the winner, the winner is protecting himself. He, he's, he's not interested in conquering anything. He's interested in feathering his nest. Oh, let's do this deal or I'll make another billion dollars. See, he's not putting his neck on the block. And then of course we get to the saint, which includes people like Jesus of Nazareth, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, uh, Yogananda, people like that. They were interested in transcending to a higher plane. 
nothing in this world really interested them. They were saints. Any questions? Yeah, uh, you know, you did such a, a great job of, of displaying the the relatively clear path, not even relatively, the clear path of, of where one could find themselves on the scale. Uh, no, I, I, I have no questions. Thank you. That was, that was okay. very good. Okay. So let me just stand closing. There's one parenthetical phrase above. It says, this scale is aligns this scale aligns with the scale of life spheres. See book two, chapter two. Uh, chapter two of book two. Book two is, is group scales. Book one is individual scales. Chapter two is the scale of life spheres. The scale of life spheres corresponds to this, and I explain in the chapter how that works. This is one of several examples where you have a manifestation which occurs in the individual, but also occurs in the group. So this same basic thing uh, exists as basic scale of basic purposes for individuals and as scale of life spheres for groups. Because you have to realize when you're talking about life spheres, it's mostly groups, unless you're at the very, very bottom. But as soon as you come up to level seven to six, you're involved with other people. Uh, so it's a group scale. So they are, they align. And I explain in the chapter how they do. If there are no questions, we can move on. All right, very good. Okay, the scale of personal influence. Now, let me tell you what I mean by personal influence. If I were to hit you over the head with a club, I would be influencing you. But that's not what I mean by personal influence. Personal influence is the way you influence somebody by your person. So you meet a person and you deal with him socially, uh, commercially, in whatever context, that person has some influence on you by virtue of his personality. So he has a personal influence on you. There are only seven basic types of personal influence. All the others are subsets of these. So this is very important in assessing somebody and in understanding somebody. Now, again, we have the plus minus where one, three, five, and seven are outflows, two, four, and six are inflows. So when a person is at, for example, level five, that is an outflow, domination. It's a very obvious outflow. When you dominate somebody, you're outflowing. See, as opposed to, as opposed to a person at level four who's aloof, he's restraining himself. That is clearly an inflow. So that is why you have this outflow inflow. Now, as with the last scale, there's a plus minus, but it's also quantum because the plus minus and the quantum are related. You see, in order to change the level on a quantum scale, you have to reverse polarity. You have to go from being inflow to being outflow or from outflow to inflow. This is a big thing. This is understood in Oriental philosophy that they'll talk about a person changing polarity. We have a massive personality change in a person. It could be going up the scale or going down the scale. So that tells you a lot about how to spot this person. Is this person outflowing or inflowing? So if you can see that the person is outflowing, you know, he's either at one, three, five, or seven, and so forth. Now let's talk about the axis. What are we measuring by this scale? What is this seven levels of? This is a scale of cause and effect. The vertical dotted line goes from cause, which is above level one, to effect, which is below level seven. Now the reason that cause is above level one is no human can be totally at cause. And no human is ever totally at effect. Okay, so you can get very, very causative, or you can be very much at effect, but it's not an absolute. So that's what we're measuring. The higher on the scale you are, 
the more causative you are. And the further down on the bottom you are, the more at effect you are. Needless to say, everybody wants to be causative. I mean, that's what success is about. You know, you go out, let's say you're a salesman, you're an encyclopedia salesman. You ring somebody's bell. This is not something that goes on anymore because encyclopedias are obsolete in, the, in paper anyway. You would knock on the door, uh, you know, would you like to buy the Encyclopedia Botanica? And the guy succeeds and the person buys. Okay, so he's being causative. If the lady says, get out of here, he's at effect. He has failed to be a cause. So that's what we're looking at. So as you go higher, it's your more cause and lower your more effect. So needless to say, you want to be as high on this scale as possible, which is true for all 35 scales. But specifically, this is what it's about. This is a manifestation of cause and effect. Now, this is a linear scale, meaning there is no apparent congruence between level one and seven. They're obviously distinct. It's a quantum scale, meaning there's no gradation. You're at level three, and then a billionth of a second later, you're at level two. So the way this would happen, for example, let's say a guy is going to psychotherapy. And he's going every week, every week, every week. And at the end of, let's say, two years, one day he says, wait a minute, I just realized something. Bang. He has a big realization. He jumps up to the next level on this scale. Now, that was, you could think that that happened in that particular session, but it didn't. So he was working towards it, working towards it. And then he suddenly realizes something. And he goes, poof, and he's at the next level. That is how change occurs in quantum scales. In other words, something that caused him to reverse polarity. And it's a general scale, like the last one we saw, meaning once you find your level on the scale, you're done. Now, you can find somebody else's level on a general scale. And once you do that, you're done. Now, of course, there's always the possibility of moving the person up to the next level, whether it's yourself or another. But there is, there is no context in this. This is generally true for the person. So let's look at these seven levels, these seven methods of personal influence. So a person at martyrdom, that's an outflow. Uh, it's not obvious that it's an outflow, but a person is sort of saying, go ahead and kill me. See, that's what martyrdom is. That's a big outflow. He's not withdrawing from anything. See, he's, he's reaching into the area. Uh, and this is a person who influences by humility. Well, what's more humiliating than martyrdom? So this is a person who's at effect. When you are martyred, that's as effect as you can get. They kill you. Up from that is influencing people by victimization. This is what is commonly known as running a guilt trip on somebody. So the mother says to the son, oh, you're breaking my heart. I wanted you to become a doctor, you know, and you become a jazz musician. Uh, I, I slaved to put you through college, and this is what I get. She, she's running a guilt trip on the kid. Well, that's victimization. She's making herself the victim. So we see this everywhere in contemporary society. People go around being victims. Uh, you know, a, a good example in the United States is we've had a black president, black secretaries of state, black Supreme Court justices, black generals, uh, many of our superstars are black. But there's still people who say, oh, I'm a victim because I'm black. Well, it didn't make Bill Cosby a victim. It didn't make Michael Jordan a victim. It didn't make Jim Brown a victim. It didn't make Jimi Hendrix a victim. See, those are people who are just using something about themselves as a way to influence people. 
you should give me more because I'm a victim. Now, of course, there are racists. There are racists everywhere you go. This is, but it doesn't mean it's a racist country because most of the people who voted for Obama were whites. Most of the people who paid money to see Michael Jordan play were whites. Most of the people who went to see Jimi Hendrix concert were whites. If you've ever been to a Jimi Hendrix concert, it's like 95% white. It rarely was there a black person in the Jimi Hendrix concert. So all these people who, who spent millions and millions of dollars buying his records, going to his concerts, were white people. See? So he just didn't make himself a victim. He just did his music. People loved it. And the rest is history. So this is not as crazy as uh, being saying, go ahead, kill me. But it sort of has that tone to it. You're sort of saying, yes, I've been victimized. And that's how you influence the person. You see this in relationships, you know, where the wife is blaming the husband, blaming the husband, blaming the husband. See, this is an inflow. She's saying, oh, all these terrible things have happened to me, and you did it all, and so I'm a victim of you. See? And obviously, that's not a healthy relationship. And a healthy relationship, they have a discussion about it. You know, a candid discussion. Okay, so what happened here? Okay, well, I'm sorry I did that. Okay, that's the end of it. So let's go up to level five, domination. Domination is another way of saying overwhelm. A person who is dominating you is overwhelming you. This is easy to see in the speeches of Adolf Hitler, uh, which most people have seen. It was clearly he was influencing the audience by overwhelming them with domination. Uh, or, for example, you know, let's say uh, you have a mafia guy, you know, he comes to you and says, you're going to give us $100 a week to protect your store. You say, well, I don't need any protection. Nobody's bothering me. And he says, well, you know, if you don't, we're going to blow up your store. See, that's domination. He's overwhelming the storekeeper. And so the guy says, okay, I'll pay. See, that's a big outfit. Off from that, you have aloofness. Aloofness is restraint. This is better done and more often done by women than men. You can often see attractive women who are very aloof. This was especially obvious in the Victorian time. Victorian women were very aloof. You know, they would restrain themselves. They were all covered up and they behaved in a very restrained, aloof way. Obviously, aloofness is a withdrawal, right? Which is a type of an inflow. So you don't have to be a woman to do this, but it's more common with women than with men. With men, you see more domination, the bully. There aren't as many women bullies as men bullies. Then you go up to three, which is reason. Reason is another way of saying logic. You influence people by logic. This is what you get from a lawyer. The lawyer reasons with the judge, reasons with the jury. He explains, does it make any sense for my client to commit this crime because he had no motive? He had nothing to gain by this. There was no insurance policy or whatever. You see? He's reasoning. Now, this is very much accepted in society. This is how upscale people most commonly influence people. You reason with somebody. So you're trying to sell somebody a car. You say, now look, I realize this car, this electric car, is going to cost more than a comparable gas-powered car, but you're not going to be subject to gas prices going up and down. You're going to be doing help for the environment. You see, this car salesman is reasoning with the client. That's what a good salesman does. That's what a good lawyer does. That's what, if you're selling anything, that is what politicians do. A politician gets up to speak. He's reasoning with you. He's saying, in my state, 
we have a surplus because we manage it properly and we have no income tax that you have to pay. See, he's reasoning with the voters. Now let's go up to charisma. This is a mysterious thing. And remember, as you get to the extremes of the scales, it's always a little bit mysterious. Charisma is a type of leadership and it is an inflow. A charismatic person has some mysterious magnetic quality that draws you to them. Jack Kennedy clearly had this. Elvis Presley clearly had this. Bill Clinton clearly had this. Ronald Reagan had this. It's some mysterious leadership magnetism where people are drawn to you. You influence people by something that you can't really sense easily with the five senses. It's, they, they, they draw you into them with their charisma. And that is how they influence you. It's almost like a type of hypnotism. I mean, they're not performing any hypnotic acts, but that is the, the result of it. People say, wow, Jack Kennedy, you know? People were really enthused about him. And to this day, his charisma persists. It's, it still radiates down. He's been dead 60 years. People still talk about it. And above that one is telepathy. Now, there are people who don't know about telepathy or might even deny the existence of telepathy. As I explained in the book, every person has telepathic ability. The question is, do you use it? Are you aware of it? So you can have a person who's telepathic. He's just not aware that he's telepathic. It's like if you had a guy with red hair and he didn't know he had red hair because he had never looked at himself in the mirror. It's there. And what is telepathy? Telepathy is controlling a person by will. You will something and it happens. So the way this works is a guy sees a girl, he's attracted to her. Telepathically, he puts the idea in her head that she's going to go out with this guy, you know? And he says, would you have dinner with me? And she says, yes. She might not even know why she said yes. She might be the type of person who doesn't usually say yes. But this guy's will was so strong that it overwhelmed her. It influenced her. So uh, a very well-known example of this is in the first Star Wars movie. When Luke and the two droids and Obi-Wan Kenobi are in the speeder. And they come to Mos Eisley spaceport. And the Empire is looking for these two droids because they have data they want. And so there are the soldiers there with, with guns. And Obi-Wan, when they get there, says, Soto Voce, these are not the droids we're looking for. And the sergeant of the guard says, these are not the droids we're looking for. Well, the Jedi clearly had these mysterious abilities that most people don't have. So he just willed this idea into the head of the soldier who was clearly his inferior. He just put the idea in his head and the guy said it. This happens a lot more than you might think. There are people who do this frequently. They have the ability to make things happen. These, these are people who are remarkably good salesman. You know, my father had, for 43 years, sold life insurance. I was remarkably successful at it. Remarkably. That has to be the hardest job in the world. You only collect after you die. Who wants to hear about that? So he would show up at someone's house and talk them into buying this life insurance policy. You're going to shell out money for 40 or 50 years. You're never going to get any of it back. See? I mean, how easy a sales job is that? That's like selling snow to the Eskimos. But somehow he was able to do it. Now, if you ever met him, you'd see he had 
a lot of personality, you might say, going for him. You can say, okay, this is the type of guy who could sell life insurance. See, I can never do that. I don't have that type of personality. Uh, so there was some element of when he walked in that door, he had to have in his mind, these people are going to buy this policy from me. And they did. And he just went through his life. That wasn't the only thing he did. He did all kinds of business deals where he made all kinds of money, where he would convince people to do things, convince people to invest, convince people to buy things, uh, buy real estate for uh, a profit, he would sell for profit and so forth. So this happens. So those are the seven types of personal influence. So when you meet a person, when you deal with a person, you look at the person. What is this person doing? So for example, I actually knew a woman who, who was around me for many years who was distinctly aloof. Needless to say, she was gorgeous. She was like perfect. Everything about her. She looked like she stepped right out of a fashion magazine all the time. She looked like that, right? And she was, I'm sure, her whole life was just fending off guys, fending off guys, fending off, you know? So uh, how did she have to fend me off? Because it wasn't a situation where I was going to do that. But, but I could see as soon as you went around her, she was aloof and she influenced you. So it's like she, in a way, she was sort of drawing you in. She was saying to you, I am so gorgeous that you can't resist me. And by restraining myself, I can get you to do whatever I want. You know, like, this is the type of person who would say, oh, would you change my tire for me? Yes, yes. See, because they draw you in. There are men who do this, uh, but it's more a female thing. Anyway, that's what the scale is about, and I advise you to use it. Here we go. Okay, the scale of choice. Uh, this, at first blush, is not obviously important, but I will try to tell you why it is absolutely important to everyone. The main theme in human history is freedom. That's what people want. That's why we fight wars. That's why we have rebellions. People want to be free. It's inherent. Everybody wants to be free. Well, what is freedom? Nobody ever asked that. Freedom is the ability to choose. So when you choose something, it's because you're free to choose it. See, guys in jail, he can't go out for a walk. He can't choose that. He can't choose to go to the park. He can't choose to go out for ice cream. He can't choose to go visit his mother. He doesn't have that choice. He's not free. He's in jail. So this is really important in how you live and how other people live. Now, this is the first of the spiral scales. If you look at level one, it says no choice. And if you look at level seven, it also says no choice. It's easy to confuse these two, which is a catastrophic mistake because you are confu confusing the worst and the best. Now at level seven, it's no choice possible. This person cannot make a choice because he's oblivious. That's what oblivion means. This person has no idea what's going on. He's not conscious. So you say to a guy, who are you going to vote for from there? He says, is there an election going on? See, he's oblivious. He doesn't even know there's an election. He can't make a choice. He doesn't even know there's an election. Whereas at level one, it, no choice is necessary. This is a transcendent person. This guy doesn't have to make a choice because he's not interested. In other words, you can say, well, if you vote the way we want you to vote, we'll give you a million dollars. 
He's not interested. He doesn't care. He's interested in uh, being a sinless person so he goes to heaven. See, that would be like a Christian version of a sentence. Uh, so it's completely the opposite in the sense that this, there's no choice, but no choice is even necessary for this person. Again, remember, most people are not going to have a reality on levels one and seven. That's the general condition. They say, that doesn't make any sense. And in the case of level one, it's because it's over their heads. And in the case of level seven, it's because it's beneath their contempt. Now, this is a quantum scale. You jump instantaneously from level to level. There's no intervening gradation. So you're at level three, and then a billionth of a second later, you're at level two. Poof. That's how it occurs. If you change, if that's how it changes, there's no gradation here. And it's a specific scale, meaning it depends on a context. So a person's ability to choose might be one way in his family, another way in his business, another way in his club, another way in his religion, another way in his political party. So you see, this could be applied in many different ways. It's not a general condition. Now, let's look at the axis. The vertical dotted line goes from at the top, complete freedom of responsibility, and at the bottom, no freedom or responsibility. So this shows you at once that there is a link between freedom and responsibility. To the extent that you shirk responsibility, you lose freedom. So a person at the bottom of the scale assumes very little responsibility and consequently has very little freedom. Now, notice that the complete freedom of responsibility is above level one because absolutes are unattainable. And it's, it's both the no freedom of responsibility is below level seven, again, because absolutes are unattainable. So you can get to a point where you have so little freedom uh, and assert so little responsibility that it's, you can't even see it or measure it, but it's not absolute. So that's what this scale is measuring. Now, don't you want to be around somebody who assumes responsibility? This tells you that a person who's irresponsible is not going to be good at making choices. The more irresponsible you are, the lower you are on the scale. So as you go up the scale, it's because you assume more responsibility. And as a result of assuming that responsibility, you have greater freedom. This tells you how do you do better in an area by assuming more responsibility for it. So let's say a guy's having some trouble with his wife, right? He looks at this, he says, well, you know, my freedom is kind of uh, being circumscribed because she's, I mean, she's not as free with me as she was before she got mad. So I have to take more responsibility. So he says, don't worry about it. I'll clean up the kitchen. Or he buys her flowers or candy. Or he takes her out to an expensive restaurant for dinner. He's assuming responsibility for her. And the result of that is that his freedom comes back with her, you see? So that tells you the pathway to ascend this scale. Assume responsibility. So you see a lot of people have very little choice regarding their children uh, because they have this failed to assume responsibility for the children. So if you have a parent that assumes tremendous responsibility for the child, the child feels that. And so when the parent says, look, I really don't want you to mess with pot. It's not good. It causes brain damage. It's illegal. Don't do it. He says, okay, because you have assumed responsibility for him. If you have been busy going out with your friends to get drunk or 
going golfing instead of taking care of the kid and you tell him that, he says, he thinks to himself, this guy was barely even around. Why should I listen to him? And this explains a lot about human relations. So again, we have the plus and the minus. So no choice necessary is an inflow. He's withdrawing. That's what transcendence means. Whereas any choice, a person who's at any choice level too, that's an outflow. He can choose anything he wants. See, that's a big outflow. I can eat chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, tutti fruity. Any, he goes into Baskin Robbins, he can make any one of them. Okay, he can have, as opposed to a guy lower on the scale, well, I only eat chocolate. See, that's, he's only taking responsibility for chocolate. So he has best choice. So again, that is why this is quantum, because you must reverse polarity to change level. So if a guy's at level three, one's own choice, something big has to happen to make him either go up to two or down to four. This is not going to just happen gradiently, and it's not just going to happen by something small, like he loses his wallet. It's not enough to make a person go down level. Loses his wife, maybe. That might be enough to knock him down a level. For some people, that's true. But it's a big deal. And you can see this. You watch a person. You know, you see a guy, right? He... Uh, He's getting $200,000 a year as uh, working for Google. And you see him a year later, he's lost his job. He got rid of his house because he couldn't make the payment. His wife has left him. And now he's, he's doing cocaine. This is a person who has changed the level on one or more scales. When you see a person crash, it usually means he's changed level on multiple scales, not just one. So this alternation here that we get between plus and minus, in this particular scale, it manifests as one viewpoint, many viewpoints, one viewpoint, many viewpoints, one viewpoint, many viewpoints. Just think about this. If a guy is at level seven, no choice possible. He has only one viewpoint. And that viewpoint is no choice is possible. That's it. That's all he knows. Then you go up to seven, group choice. This is a person who is a collectivist. The group decides for him. Well, that's many viewpoints, isn't it? In the old Soviet Union, they would decide what school you would go to, what job you would have, what apartment you would live in, if you could get a car, and if you could get a car, when you could get a car. Right? So it's collectivist. In other words, the people, the people decide. It's an abstraction. You don't really choose. The, it's the group's choice. Some group decides, and you're stuck with it. So because it's a group, there are many viewpoints. Everybody in that group is one of the viewpoints. So this is a big outflow in the sense that you're reaching out to the group. You're saying, okay, I'm part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and they're going to decide what school I go to. See, so that's an outflow. You're not withdrawn from that. You're reaching that. Now, if you go up to level five, now you have a withdrawal. Another choice is might be called robotism. You are a robot to someone else. That person is makes your decision. So you have the term the general's general. You know who the general's general is? His wife. This general has 100,000 men under his command, and all of them do anything he says immediately without questioning it. That's how it is in the military. He says, okay, 
You will go to sector two and you will attack at dawn. Yes, sir. They go. Okay. But when he goes home at night, his wife says, go change a shirt. We're going out to see the Smiths. He says, yes, dear. He's a robot. You see this in bad relationships. It could go either way. The husband telling the wife what to do or the wife telling the husband what to do. But it doesn't have to be only in a marriage. You have this in the mafia. The mafia boss says, go out and kill Vito. Okay? The guy says, yes. He goes, he's a robot. There's no choice there. Or you might say, the, the choice is another choice. And that's the way to understand this. It's a choice, but it's not your choice. It's the other person's choice. And that's a withdrawal. You're not outflowing. When, when the boss tells you to do something, you don't argue with him. You get fired that way. And uh, in the mafia, you get fired by getting shot, usually, or stabbed. So when you go up a level, you go to any choice but one's own. This is extremely prevalent, but most people are going to have trouble grasping this. This is what irresponsibility is. An irresponsible person will make a choice, but it's not his own choice. So let me tell you how this works. You all go to a Chinese restaurant, right? First person says, I'll have the chow mein. Next guy says, have the chow mein. Next guy says, I'll have the chow mein. Comes to this guy, you know what he says? I'll have the chow mein. You know why? Because it's any choice but one's own. He's not responsible enough to make his own choice. A person at level three would say, wait a minute, I don't want chow mein. I want mogu gai pan. So he makes his own choice. But at this level, you you choose, but it's not your own choice. This is what we call trendy people. And you see this all the time. Like, for example, if you look at the eyelashes that women are wearing in the past five years, they are preposterously long compared to the eyelashes women were wearing five years ago, right? Why are they doing that? Because it's any choice but one's own. Now, if you ask the person, did you choose those eyelashes? They'll say, oh, yes. But they didn't really, because they're doing it because everybody else does it. So you'll see a guy, right? He's a Republican. He goes to Columbia, where everybody is a Democrat. So he's in Columbia University now. So he becomes a Democrat. Why? Because it's any choice but one's own. All these people are Democrats. So you ask, were you a Democrat? Yes. Did you choose to be a Democrat? Yes. But he's actually a Democrat because he's surrounded by Democrats. And they will harangue him if he's not a Democrat. So he's not responsible enough to make the choice. So you have many viewpoints. All these people tell you to do these things. So because all these people are telling you to do it, that's many viewpoints, you outflow into this. You say yes, but you present it as your own choice, which it, which it really isn't. That's what peer pressure is about. So a guy who's responsible, somebody comes to him and says, would you like to smoke some pot? No, I don't do that. A guy at level four says, okay. So he's not responsible enough to say no. He's just going along with the crowd. All from that, you get to what some people would call a selfish person. One's own choice. This guy actually makes his own choice. So you go to a restaurant, you know, what would you like for dessert? Well, I have apple pie. The next guy says, I'll have apple pie. The third guy says, yeah, I'll have apple pie too. This guy says, no, I don't want apple pie. I want the cheesecake. He's making his own choice. He doesn't care what they're doing. He has one viewpoint, and that viewpoint is his own. And that is why people who call him selfish. No, he's selfish literally in the sense that 
he chooses it for himself. But downscale people who are incapable of choosing for themselves will say, oh, he's a selfish person. He always has to have his own way. Well, the reason he has to have his own way is because he's more responsible than you. He makes his own choice. He says, you know, I decided I don't want to do this. Makes his own choice. Okay. And that's the one viewpoint. It's an inflow. He inflows into himself. He consults himself. What do I really want here? And that's what he does. This person is, could be called an individualist. Uh, he could be called a nonconformist. This is the type of person who, in many contexts, will get in trouble. You know, like, if he goes in the military, this guy's going to have a lot of trouble. Okay, so they're out in the field, and the cook comes around and he serves breakfast. It's oatmeal. That's it. That's what they have. That's what you get. Take it or leave it. He says, I don't want oatmeal. Too bad. Okay? He has his own viewpoint. He wants bacon and eggs. There is no bacon and eggs. You're going to eat oatmeal. And you better eat it because don't tell us three hours from now you're hungry. So then we go up to level two. Level two is a liberated state. Any choice. This person is aloof. He doesn't really care. So he knows there's an election going on. He doesn't really care who gets elected because he, he's aloof. This person uh, has many viewpoints because any choice is another way of saying many viewpoints. This is a guy who, you know, he says, well, I can vote Republican. I can vote Democrat. I can vote Libertarian. I can go to the Green Party. You know, he's sort of in, in an aloof state. He might not even vote at all because he's aloof. So there are, he has many viewpoints. This guy has a lot of freedom, right? Because any choice, that's what any choice means. It means freedom. So he is not painted into any corner, okay? He's aloof from the whole deal. And a lot of people would not understand that. He just to make any choice. So I'll give you an example. His girlfriend says to him, I want to go for Chinese food. He says, okay. The next day, she says, I don't want to go for Chinese food. He says, okay. Where do you want to go? I want Italian food. Okay. And she changes her mind. I decided I don't want Italian food. He says, okay. See, it's any choice. He doesn't care what she says. He doesn't care if she says, let's go to Denny's. He just doesn't care. He's aloof. He's not into this conflict. You see, she's there saying, well, what do I really want? You know, they want French food, I want Italian food. Uh, and if I want French food, do I want Parisian food? Do I want country? You know, he just doesn't care. He's not thinking about it. You know, um, this is the type of guy you ask him, what's your favorite color? He says, I don't have a favorite color. They're all colors, uh, they're all fine. He's just not getting into that. He's just not. Because he has assumed so much responsibility, any color is fine. So somebody gives him a brown shirt, he says, thank you. Do you like the color? Yeah. Somebody else gives him a red shirt. Do you like it? Yes. Do you like red? Yes. See? Any choice. This is a liberated place to live. Because you're not, you don't have a problem because you don't care which it is because you're aloof. And the highest is no choice necessary. This voice doesn't even have to make a choice. Okay? He, he's not merely aloof. He is withdrawing from the world. You see, when you have any choice, you're sort of reaching out into all the choices. You say, apple pie, yes. Custard pie, yes. Chocolate cake, yes. You see, they're all yes. 
many viewpoints. He looks at the menu. He can have anything. He doesn't really care. You could or you could order for him and he'll say fine. The, the guy at level one, he is withdrawn into this transcendent state. He's not even thinking about the colors or the desserts. He just he just doesn't make a choice. He makes no choice at all. You know, he's just beyond. He's transcendent. And you find these people in ashrams, in monasteries, in rectories, in convents. You know, these are people who, they're, in, they're interested in, if they're Buddhist, they're interested in attaining nirvana. You know, whatever context the person is in, he's transcendent. And so, no choice is necessary. Any question? No, I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting hearing you describe and go through these and, and, and immensely beneficial um, as you're going through them, of course, as I, I hope that anybody could or should do, it's very easy to see I can place myself on these scales and I can even see where lots of my associates are, where my friends are. And, and, and that is so helpful to be able to establish those, those kind of, uh, ground rules almost the, the the type of the type of conversations I can have with them so they can understand and I can help them they can help me or I can choose to to you know maybe they're they're too far down the the, the list and I, I I don't need to help them I can't help them because it's not going to be beneficial so those things are so beneficial uh, as as I'm hearing you you go through these very helpful thank you right, right. so you say to your buddy you want to go golfing today on Saturday he says no my wife wants me to go to a fashion show with her. You can't talk him out of that. He is a robot. You know, if his wife says, mow the lawn, he mows the lawn. So you see this often in children, you know, where the parent tells the child to do something and the kid does it. So we generally think of that as a good thing because kids don't know what they're doing and they need somebody to tell them, you know, don't touch the stove, okay? You're gonna hurt yourself. He says, okay. So he does what he's told. So, but as that kid grows, he should go up the scale and get to a point where he can make his own choice. You know, maybe he'll say, well, my dad told me not to smoke pot and I'm not going to do it. But it's not because he told me not to do it. It's because I think I shouldn't do it or I don't want to do it. So, see, he's come up scale. So it's not the choice, it's how he thinks about it. So this is really important in dealing with people. If you get a trendy person, they're gonna do what the crowd does. And there's nothing you can do about that. Well, and They're gonna say, well, everybody does this. On, That's the justification for it. On, on the, the, the last scale that we were just discussing, it, it was really kind of eye-opening to me to place myself in that scale because, you know, it's getting to the holiday seasons and, and people are like, oh, hey, what do you want? What's your favorite? And, and I, for a long time, I, I don't do favorites very well. Like, I don't have favorites. People, I, I teach I teach uh, martial arts and who's your favorite student? I don't have a favorite student. I, I don't want to play that game. I, I don't want to see people higher or lower. I don't, I don't, you know, what's your favorite this or that? I don't do favorites. That's not something. And, and that's really, uh, you talked about, it's difficult for people to understand what that means at the, you know, the, the, the upper levels or the lower levels of the scale. And we're like, what do you mean you don't have favorites? You don't like, I don't like this and I like this. I go to my, I go to the, to the lady who cuts my hair and, and uh, she said, hey, do you like what I had last time? Yeah, but we can do something different this time. Oh, you didn't like it? No, no, I liked it. I just, let's do something different. It's going to grow back. It's not, not a big deal. So it, as I'm trying to establish and, and, and tell people about that, they're like, what? what are you talking about? You don't have favorites? What does that mean? Uh, so it's very it's very understanding for me, especially on that one uh, in particular, because I, you know, I tell people that they're like, what, what does that mean? You don't have favorites? So yeah, very, very helpful. And, and what it means, you said, what does that mean? What it means is, you're at a lower level on this scale. That's exactly what it means. And remember, everyone is somewhere at some level on every scale, whether they know it or not. Just like the Fibonacci sequence, 
All those sunflowers, if you count them, they have Fibonacci numbers in their seeds. They don't know that. They don't know anything about numbers, but they do it generation after generation. That's how most people are. So what I say is the smart thing is take advantage of this data. I'm giving it to you. Use it. It's a big advantage. You see a guy who, you know, is he bosses his wife, wife around, she does whatever uh, he, he says. Don't go to her, you know, because she's your girlfriend and say, you know, you wouldn't, shouldn't be that way. You're not going to get anywhere with this because she's a robot for this guy. Now, what you could do is try to bring her up to a higher level. But at first, you would have to get her to spot what level she's at before you could do that. Then you could get her to up to the next one. But it's not going to be quick and it's not going to be easy. Yes. Well, hey, Jim, as we come to our end of our, our, our time for today, I very much look forward to continuing this path as we as we learn and grow and, and get to establish what these scales look like and how we can better apply them to our lives. And so, uh, again, I look forward to that next time. And, and for listeners, for the viewers of this, I, I appreciate you. If you could uh, leave a, a like, a, a subscribe to our to our channel here, drop us a comment. I'd be more than happy to to correspond with you that way. Until next time, make every day count.